right, everybody, let's come on in. If you're out there in the foyer, we're going to ask that you come on in and find your seat and grab a songbook. Go ahead and stand up with me and turn to number 651. We'll start off with 651, and we'll sing the first verse, and we'll go out and shake some hands, and then we'll sing the last verse when we come back. So that's number 651. If y'all would please stand with me, grab your songbooks, and we'll go ahead and get started. All right, here we go. I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name. Amen. You'll go around and shake some hands for a minute, would you please? Make sure you smile at somebody. All right, everybody, let's come on back, and we're going to sing that last verse, number 651, if you lost your spot, 651, since I have been redeemed. This is a great song. I hope you have a time where you can say you have been redeemed. Number 651, here we go. I have a home prepared for me since I have been redeemed, where I shall dwell eternally since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in His name. Since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name. Amen. All right, y'all remain standing because we uh, did not sing a very important song this morning. Yeah, we have to sing Happy Birthday. All right, Miss Barbara, his birthday is tomorrow. Oh, oh, it's today? Oh, man, I have to check my sources. Like, yes, I know how to read a number, so my source is wrong. <laughs> so, so happy birthday today. And also, Mr. Jerry Vaughn. Uh, man, I don't think he's here this evening. So, he is? Okay. Where's he at? Oh, he's out there. All right, well, you know what? And yes. And it's your spiritual birthday. Oh, speaking of that spiritual birthday, uh, I heard that Miss Christine, Miss Christine, did you just get your spiritual birthday today? Miss Christine just got saved today. 
and she is excited about it. There we go. All right. So there is a lot of happy birthday to be singing. <laughs> so we got two spiritual birthdays, two actual birthdays. Brother Jerry, we're going to say happy birthday to you. All right, here we go. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. All right, let's put another one on there, okay? Here we go. But one will not do. You've got to have to take Christ as your Savior. And then you'll have to. Let's remember that one. That was kind of fun. All right, maybe seated. I like that one, Daniel. That's a good one. That is a good one. Yes, Miss Christine, we are rejoicing with you this night that you got saved just how long ago just 15 minutes ago Christine got saved praise God for that amen that's shouting time and glory right amen I heard of a man who attended church one week and become incre became increasingly agitated with the message on the way out he stopped to speak to the pastor he said you really have to do something about your sermons you speak about the same topic every time I am here. The preacher said, yeah, but you only come on Easter Sunday. <laughs> Think about it. Okay. All right. Do we have that sermon and sock tonight, Daniel? We're going to do sermon and a sock tonight. I'm not going to belabor all the announcements. We've got a lot of things happening. As I said before, we're going to get the flags up now. Daniel, tell me what are the new four flags that we added. It's going to be these two here. Anybody want to take a guess what the blue one is? Australia, right? Australia, mate. Okay. And the one on the end, I, I, can't, I don't recognize that one. Burkina Faso. Okay. I can see his face. I'm trying to think of the name of our missionary in Burkina Faso. Knickerbockers. Okay, the Knickerbockers. All right, and we got two new ones over here on this end, the far end here. Uh, let's start with the, uh, the red and yellow. Belgium. No? Red and yellow is Spain. And the, the one on the end with the black, yellow, and, and red is Belgium. Okay, great. Super. Uh, who do we have in Belgium? Yes. Debbie Taylor. Yes, young lady in Belgium. And who do we have in Spain? The Waters. Levon Waters and his wife. Okay. So praise the Lord for that. Two slots left. I wonder what happens at missions conference if we ha take on more missionaries. We're going to have to get more flags up. Brian's already got it posted. We're going to put them up that way, right? All right, we'll figure somewhere to put it. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, it's good to be back in the Lord's house tonight. I hope you had a great afternoon. Folks I've talked to this afternoon said, yeah, I got, a, I got to rest. I got to go to sleep this afternoon. And I'm jealous. <laughs> oh, man. Oops. All right, we're going to do our uh, sermon in a sock. Although this is a not traditional sermon in a sock right now. Uh, so let me see. Joe, you want to come up and bring your thing? This is a sermon in an Easter egg. <laughs> it's not a sermon in a sock, sermon in an Easter egg. All right. Uh, so let me see. I'm going to pick on Carrie. So let's have Carrie come on down. And uh, I haven't picked on Mr. Al for this in a while. So uh, Mr. Al, would you like to come on down? <laughs> I don't even know what's in here. I just know a small one to fit in an Easter egg. So again, we do like a little uh, sermonette application for whatever is concealed inside this, and we'll go around the room and see what you guys think and see if you can make a spiritual application over the contents of this mystery Easter egg. Oh, there we go. Yes. Let's go. All right. All right. We got, and I, I don't even know where this was, three Lego blocks put together. All right. Three Lego blocks are put together in this little Easter egg, and it's great that they're here, so I don't have to step on them at night. <laughs> yep, so you've got three Lego blocks put together. All right, three little Lego box, or blocks. So, uh, let me see, I think I know what Carrie's gonna say. I'm gonna have to Carrie start off. <laughs> well, that's Al. Huh? Can we start, Mr. Al? Yeah. All right, let me think here. Okay, well, 
you got three blocks here, but the Bible's made of 66 books, and uh, and they do not contradict one another, and they all fit. They all fit formally uh, together. Uh, so. I like that. <laughs> wow, that was pretty good, <laughs> man. <laughs> um, well, there's a lot of different things. I, that's why I like the Legos. There's so many different things you could do with it. Um, but I think the verse that comes to my mind is talking about how you are made a, um, a new creature in Christ Jesus, and you're also his workmanship. And uh, you take these blocks, and you put them together, and you start making something out of it. Um, you know, if you, if you separate them, you just have three separate blocks. But when you start putting them together, you start making a tower out of it, um, or you want to make something, especially if you have more blocks. And God, in a spiritual sense, begins to conform us more into the image of Christ and uh, builds upon our lives um, not on a work foundation, but on his foundation, and it's a solid foundation. I mean, there's so many different things you could do with it, but um, I'm just glad that Jesus is still working on me, and uh, that's a special. Okay, Carrie, I thought you were going to say that we were rooted and built up in him. Oh, you could do that. Yeah. <laughs> but I was thinking there in Matthew 16 when uh, Jesus is saying, uh, upon this rock I will build my church, and uh, he's talking about Jesus himself. Upon Jesus himself, he's going to build his church, and the thing that this is missing is uh, a really coveted Lego piece. It's the big green wide one with all the, the flat one with all the dots on there that you can build your house on or build your fort on. All right, everyone wants those. If you're building Legos, you got to have that piece. Well, you can't build a Christian life without a foundation. And you got to have that foundation that Christ gives. If not, then you're building your house on the sand. And this little block tower right here will easily just fall over. All right, you got to have a foundation for this to sit on. All right, cool little Lego application. All right, well, we'll start over here on the left. All right, what do you have to say about Legos, Ms. Iomara? Okay, and she uh, noticed that these are different colors, and one of them is a different texture, and uh, it just represents different times of our uh, life that we go through different periods of life in our Christian walk. Miss Zuma, or sorry, not Zuma, Jackie. I mean, if you read the instructions. But. Ms. <laughs> Jackie says you have to have a booklet, and, you know, we have a booklet for life, and that's our Bible. So there you go. Your life doesn't go together well unless you have your Bible. You're leading it by Matthew. You got something for us? All right. Yep, Jesus can build your life in his ways. Oh, that's awesome. That's great. Zachary. There you go. All right, talking about Jesus being the head of the corner, that cornerstone for us. Joe. That is great. Yeah, just like someone formed these Legos, God has to form us into good Christians. That is pretty great. McKinley, you like Legos? Yeah, you want to say something about the Legos? You just like Legos. All right, what about over here in the middle? Okay, over on this side, Andrew. Oh, I like that, Andrew. Amen. 
There you go. That is a great application, Andrew. So Legos have a price. And for us, our, we, our cost is just daily living with him, but it costs Jesus his very life. And that's a great application there, Andrew. Corbin. That is great. That's like the body of Christ. It can be built in something bigger than yourself. All right. Mr. Jerry. Yes, sir. There you go. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, you don't want to use those mega blocks with Legos. So. <laughs> uh huh. Mm hmm. Gotta be careful about them counterfeits. Definitely. Yep. Yeah. Jonathan. Mm-hmm. Yep. That is awesome. Yep, God uses different pieces to build up into one thing. That's kind of what Zero Mar was saying. We've got different colors and all that, but that's the different kind of people that God uses to build up into one building, and one body of Christ. All right, what about over here on the right? All right, Miss Crystal? Okay, contrast in Babel being built up the wrong way, the wrong purpose, versus Nehemiah building the wall of Jerusalem, uh, building up for the right purpose. That's great. Gabby. That is great, Gabby. God, God would break down your little Lego tower and make something better out of it. So that is good. Thank you, Gabby. Isabel. Yep, talking about God's creation uh, being ordered, and I look at some of the things that Tristan builds, and yeah, that's definitely not random pieces falling together. He built some uh, exciting stuff, but yeah, God did have a purpose when he made the universe. All right, well, thank y'all very much. We're going to get into another song, but man, oh, hold on, we got one more? Oh, I'm sorry, Tristan. Man, Lego master. All right. What do you think, Tristan?
Mm -hmm. There you go. He's saying like a skilled Lego builder will build something good, just like God when he makes something, it's better than anyone else can make. So yeah, thank you, Tristan. All right, thank you. I wish I had some candy to give you guys. But you had candy this morning. So, so. <laughs> All right, we're going to sing a song, and then we'll have offering after our next song here. All righty. So number 419, if you would, and go ahead and stand up with me. Grab your songbooks, 419. And I need to get there too. 419 is 419. And this is We Are Marching to Zion. We'll go ahead and sing. Uh, yeah, we'll sing the first, second, and the last verse of this song. And guys, come down when we get that uh, last verse sung. So the first, second, and last verse of We're Marching to Zion. Here we go. Come with that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord, join in a song with sweet accord, and thus surround the throne, and thus surround the throne. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion, we're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. But children of the heavenly King, but children of the heavenly King, may speak their joys abroad, may speak their joys abroad. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to city of God. Then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds on high. We're marching fine gentleman is going to pray. All right. <laughs> Let's pray. Amen. You may be seated.
rest over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never go home. And someday yonder we will never more wander, but walk on streets as our purest gold. Though often tempted, tormented and tested, and like the prophet, my pillow was stone. And though I find here no permanent dwelling, I know he'll give me a mansion my own. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where We'll never grow old And someday yonder We will never more wander But walk the streets that are pure as gold Poor or deserted or lonely, I'm not discouraged. I'm heaven bound. I'm just a pilgrim in search of a city. I want a mansion, a harp and a crown. I've got a mansion. Just over the hilltop In that bright land where We'll never go roam And someday yonder We will never more wander But walk the streets as Our purest gold My name. Kind of, uh, ah, I see what's happening. I might need fresh batteries because I've got it's jumping from two to one on me. So we can try that. Now I can't hear myself. You guys can hear me. Okay. How many enjoyed your afternoon? Should be on. Testing. One, two. Hello? Anybody here? Yeah. No? Oh, I'm so glad you're here. Amen. That's much better. It actually happened this morning, too. I, I put some batteries in for my Sunday school class to do, and, and it died on me. It just, even before I started, I had to go put some more so-called fresh batteries in there. Okay. All right. Well, hope you did have a good afternoon and got your rest and so forth. And if you didn't, wait till you get home and get the rest then, okay? Give me about 30 minutes and we'll go to the house. But, uh... I am so excited about you guys being here tonight because I'll be very honest with you. Can I confess something tonight? Sure. Here we go. Uh, I had some families this morning said, well, preacher, we probably won't make it back tonight. we got some family things going for Easter. I said, hey, I understand what's going on. And I counted in the building tonight 56 people. Amen. Amen. It doesn't look like that, but there's 56 folks here tonight. Jonathan, this is your sister here with you tonight? Glad you're here tonight. You guys make her feel at home, okay? All right, so uh, 
And then if, if Amy had been in church like she should have been in church, it would be 57. Amen. <laughs> With Drew, it would be 58. They went up to Richmond today. So, But Carrie, you went to Richmond too, and you came back. <laughs> You're glutton. He's spiritual. He's not spiritual. We used to say, jokingly say, he's spiritual. Not spiritual, but uh, glad you're back, son. It's always a joy to have you. Okay, is something I'm not picking up on, the candelarias? Oh, wonderful, good. Okay. No doubt, no doubt. Um, if you didn't hear it on this side of the auditorium, um, Heather Candelaria, one of our young military families that was here with us, they're over in Kentucky now, and she, you remember we've been praying for her because the white blood cell count was really out of whack, and she was in the hospital and hurting an infection in the hip, right? They don't know yet. They're, waiting on they're still waiting on results on that. Mm. Okay. Um, but she, that, the white blood cell count is back to normal. But they've got some issues of what she's going through, and they want to retain her in the hospital for a little bit. And so let's pray for Heather tonight. I've had Ray on my heart all day, Al. Sandy, uh, how's he doing? He, got, uh, he has uh, a doctor's appointment tomorrow with his uh, family doctor and uh, another appointment Tuesday with his urologist. And we'll find out, at least Tuesday anyway, more long-term kind of where he stands. Okay. Wow. So, uh, uh, we've got all kinds of questions, and, and you know, you know, don't know, you know, uh, whether this is extremely serious or just a little bit serious, or maybe things are normal now. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm in that whole range okay. of thought there, so uh, we just don't know yet. Okay, so Dre's going to one, one doctor tomorrow, and the yeah, urologist and, and, uh, on Tuesday. Yeah, that's so, the one that, that we need to talk to. Really need to talk to. Okay, we need to pray for Ray. And uh, if you get a chance, step over to the rehab and see him. He's in room 308, Coliseum Rehab. Coliseum Rehab on Executive Drive. It's about Convalescent Center. It's about three miles from here. It's going down the main road here. The last stoplight before you get to the interstate, you take a left there at the 7-Eleven and the Exxon. Go to the second stoplight and take a right, you're on Executive Drive. Go about a quarter mile, and it's down right on the left. You can't miss it. It's a 7-Eleven across from where he is. Matter of fact, Ray, Ray is like me. He likes windows. And he's got three big windows there in his room. And he likes to lay into bed and look at 7-Eleven and all what's happening outside. So, so if we would, let's pray for Ray tonight. Father, we come before you on behalf of Heather and ask you, God, to... Well, first, Lord, we just want to thank you that the blood... White blood cell count is back to normal. We praise you for that. And Lord, we would like to ask of you and these other issues that she's going through, and as the doctors are wanting to retain her there uh, in the hospital, we pray, Lord, that you'll give them wisdom and direction and that, that soon she will be much, even much better and be able to be back at the house. Uh, God, be with Ellie and the children. And oh, Lord, I, I pray that they'll sense and know that that loved ones and friends and brothers and sisters of Christ that love, definitely love them and want to see things well for them. Lord, I thank you for Ray tonight. Lord, his love for you, his faithfulness to you. And Lord, I pray to these next two doctor's appointments, one tomorrow and the urologist on Tuesday. Lord, we pray for good news. We pray, God, that you'll just strengthen him, be with him. And uh, Lord, I bless him this Easter day. I know his heart would want to be here. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 By the way, if you go see Ray, take him a large Wendy's Frosty. He loves them. Or sweet tea. Or sweet tea. Oh, he's thirsty for sweet tea. Okay. All right. All right, let's go to Luke 24 that we're in this morning. I want to go back there and share a few thoughts with you tonight. I love, I love reading the Bible. The stories of Calvary never get old. The stories of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus never get old. Uh, this is a great day of victory that has taken place here. And when Christ, the risen Christ, what is he like? 
what is Jesus like now that he's alive from the dead, you know? Ask that question as we go through this message tonight. What is the risen Christ like now that he has risen from the dead? It became a great day of victory. We're going to get to Luke 24, verse 13 in just a few moments here. The day of the resurrection. Never a day happened like this before where uh, God died, or at least the Son of God died and rose again from the dead. Uh, strangely enough, on this day, uh, the disciples doubted. Uh, they did not believe that he was alive, right? But his enemies, Jesus' enemies, they believed something was going on, so much so that they asked Pilate to have some Roman guards to, to guard the tomb. Why guard the tomb of a dead man? That's got to be another. One of these days, Brian, I'm going to preach a, par- a message on paradoxes of the cross and of the resurrection. I almost preached tonight on the paradox of one of the greatest statements ever made by the scribes and the Pharisees at the cross as they railed on Jesus. He saved others himself he cannot save. And the paradox is if he had not, if he had saved himself, then we couldn't be saved. But then things like this, you know, with the, with the resurrection, the di- disciples doubting, but these, these wicked uh, Pharisees and scribes and all these ones, who, who, they must have thought something could have happened, whether someone could take him, the body away and claim he was resurrected, you know. What is Christ like? Ask the question. What is Christ like since his resurrection? In his coming into this world, he came in a humble birth. there in a manger stall. Uh, you watch the life of Christ I'm going to have a little time with this, this window tonight in the sun. Y'all bear with me, okay? By the way, we're looking into getting some shade-tinted window, putting tint on the windows here. That would help the preacher tonight for sure. Um, what about the compassion of Jesus Christ? You're going to find that even in what happens after he rose from the dead, what's the Christ like after he rose from the dead? You're going to see compassion coming out as he deals with a man, I believe it's a man and wife. Cleopas, and we don't have the name of the other one, uh, but I believe it's a man and wife as they're going to Emmaus. You might say, like our friends down in Bacosan, Emmaus. You might say, like uh, that, le- that person you have on your GPS, Emmaus. She, they're wrong. He or she, whoever she is, is wrong. It's Emmaus, okay? Amen. How many heard Emmaus all through your life? Yeah, anybody ever heard Emmaus? Maybe if you came from Pocosin, you know, you guys live in Pocosin. You all not even heard that, have you? Okay. Emmaus. Yeah. Anyway, you go down to Emmaus Baptist Church. There's an Emmaus Baptist Church down there, and they say Emmaus. What about his life? Things are changing now. He's after he is risen from the dead. Remember as he wept over Jerusalem? Uh, as he wept at a grave with Lazarus? And even as he was silent most of the time at his trial. And as he goes through Calvary and and in the caring that he had for others, even while he was hanging on the cross, you remember as we said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Uh, Today to the thief, I'm going to put the thief on this side tonight. Today, (laughs) the thief, uh, thou shalt be with me in paradise, you know, the caringness of Christ, even on the cross. Um, And then to his mom. You know, uh, to Mary and John, woman, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother. The compassionate part of, of Christ, he doesn't lose that. He's still God, a very God's. And, and so let's take a look, if we would, tonight, just a little bit here. In verse number 13, and as he communicates himself and shows himself, and I've often wondered, why did he pick these two? Now he shows himself. To Mary Magdalene at the grave, we know that. We, uh, the angel showed themselves to the women that were at the grave. We preached on that this morning. But then to come, and one of the first, first ones he shows himself to is to this couple. Why did he choose them? They left Jerusalem. They even walked out of Jerusalem. Hey, it's over. Can you imagine how they felt? These people had followed Christ for three and a half years. Can you imagine how these people felt? And it's all over. It's done with. We've lost. He, he was the one we thought was going to lead us against Rome. And, 
and bring back the nation of Israel to its glory days and power, you know? We thought, hey, look at all these miracles he does. He even raised others from the dead. And surely this is the one who's going to redeem Israel. I don't know exactly what went through their minds, you know, but they were just sad. They were discouraged as they're walking away from Jerusalem. This couple, Cleopas and, again, I'm going to say his wife. Uh, look at verse number 13. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called e Emmaus. Thank you. Is that my wife giggling tonight? Somebody was giggling. Okay. Which was from Jerusalem, about three score. How many is three score? A score is 20. Three score is 60, right? Furlongs. How long is a furlong? Anybody want to take a stab at that one? Some of you have a study Bible in your lap? 582? 582 feet. Okay. I was studying, said it's an eighth of a mile. That might be 582. Uh, how, much is, how many feet are in a thousand? I mean, in a mile. 5,280, right? In a mile? Okay. Anyway, my Bible talks about furlongs being an eighth of a mile. Sixty-eighths of a mile would equal about how much to walk. I calculated seven and a half miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. <laughs> to Emmaus. All right? That's a good walk. Some of you get past a quarter of a mile and you're panting and puffing and puffing like I do. All right? Well, seven and a half mile walk. You've got to remember back then, they didn't have the bicycles, they have the cars, they have all the other ways and means of transportation. Walking was pretty much it, unless it was a, a okay, some of you say donkey. I say donkey. It's a donkey. One of these days you'll realize it's a donkey. Uh, or a, a burro, or a camel, or something like that. Uh, but they're walking. And notice how Jesus comes along. Uh, he's the Christ that... This one who rose from the dead, he's still the one who wants to walk with men and women. Think that. Let that sink in a little bit tonight. Don't just read the speed, read the Bible. Look at what's taking place here, okay? Verse 14, And they talked together of all these things, this couple, which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, they tried to figure this out. Their whole lives have been turned upside down. Jesus, you know, even when you become perplexed about life's issues and life's problems, Jesus walks by. Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Now, he could have been, Jared, he could have been if someone had just walked on by him. But he didn't. He wanted to walk with them. Look at the heart of God. Through Jesus Christ, as He's risen from the dead, He still wants to walk with men. He still wants to walk with us. These disciples are depressed. He's concerned, no doubt. And they're returning back to their home in Emmaus. And it should have been a day of rejoicing for them. But they're retreating. It should have been a day of triumph. This should be the greatest victory, and it is the greatest victory. Jesus rose from the dead. This should be a great victory, and it becomes a day of defeat to them, you know. And yet Christ understands. He knows what's happening. Trembling even. A lot of the, the other disciples, the other 11 plus other disciples, locked themselves up in a room. They were afraid that the Romans were going to come and get them, or the chief priests and the Pharisees and the scribes were going to get them. So they locked themselves up in a room. Should have been a day for shouting. Should have been a day for singing. This day that Jesus rose, just like we sang this morning. He lives, he lives. Right. Amen. It should be a day of singing, of shouting. But it wound up being a sad day. And then, just like it is in our lives, ladies and gentlemen, on the saddest moments of our lives, the living Christ comes along and just says, I'm going to walk with you. And he does so. He drew near and he walked with them. Uh, you see, this living Jesus, we asked the question, or made the statement, the risen Christ, what is he like? This is same, the same Jesus before he died and was risen again. The same Jesus, it di resurrection didn't make Christ aloof from his disciples. Resurrection drew him to his disciples. The resurrected Christ was not remote from where he needed to be. 
He was right there with them where he needed to be. Where do you think where Christ would go if he came here physically tonight? I think he'd come to the house of God. I think he'd come to the house of prayer, he called it. I think he'd come to be around his people. You know, he wanted to be around this couple in particular because something wonderful was going to take place. And now the triumph, this triumph that Jesus has had, he's risen from the dead, it has not changed his character. It has not changed his tenderness. It has not changed the compassionate Christ. I still want to walk with you. Wow. Mm. He is the Christ who cares to walk with us, and he cares for our problems. And this couple is going through great problems. Look at uh, verse number 16. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. Look at verse 17 in particular. And he said unto them, he starts questioning him. Just like the, the two angels, you remember this morning, question the ladies at the, at the, gray, the empty tomb? You know, what co- now Jesus comes along and he asks some questions. He's going to ask questions of us and he, as he walks with us, not so much that he doesn't know the answers, because he knows the answers, he just wants to hear us tell him. That this living Savior can walk with you and wants to talk with you and wants to listen to you. I don't know about you, but that's precious to me. That God, who's alive, wants to talk with me. And yes, sometimes He wants to get me, ask me questions to get me to answer, not so much that He doesn't know those answers, but that I get to see myself in those answers. What did He say? He asked them a question. What manner of communications, these talks that you're having between Cleopas and your wife, what manner of communications are these that you have one to another? I think sometimes the Lord just wants to come along some of our husband and wives and they're having discussions. He wants to say, what kind of communications are you having? Make sure those communications please him. Amen. That's a side note. That was free. Didn't cost you anything. Won't cost you any extra tithe or nothing like that. As ye walk and are sad. So we've got a a living Christ who understands the reason why they're sad, but he wants to hear it from their lips. What are you guys talking about, is he saying? And and as I'm walking here with you, uh, why are you sad? This This is the one who just got up from the dead. Is walking with him. Why are you sad? Hmm. He knew, but he wanted them to tell him. And that's the way God is today. God, when he communicates, and this is why sometimes we don't, we don't want to walk with God as much as we think we say we ought to walk with God because God starts probing our heart. And when he probes our heart, he does it so that we can confess and we can draw closer to this living Christ. Yeah, man. Come on now. I'll bring out my signs in a few minutes, okay? He wants to talk to you. He wants you to talk to him, and he's going to ask you and probe you with some questions for your good and to show himself who he is. Now, watch what takes place. He wants Christ, this Christ who's alive wants to walk with us. This Christ who is alive also cares for our problems that we go through. Okay, here's the problem. What was the problem they were going through? He's dead. He's dead. They think he's dead. You ever go through some times in life and you feel like God is so far away and it thinks, wow, does he even care anymore? Is he even, is he even alive? You know? But he is. And he's right there. Notice, uh, a lot of, and, he's, and who else was depressed? You know, sometimes a Christian can get depressed. If you dwell on the wrong things, you can depress yourself very quickly. Satan can offer you thoughts and you start believing those thoughts and and you swallow them hook, line, and sinker and you get discouraged and get depressed and all the D's start coming in. What is it? The devil, deceit, uh, destroyer, uh, depression, all things I just mentioned. Watch out. Watch out for depression. You don't have to live a depressed life. Why? Because you've got a living Christ 
that wants to walk beside you and talk with you and listen to you. Yeah, man, I might just do a lap or two around here tonight. Glory to God. His disciples, the ones left back at the, the eleven, and the others that were there with them, they were sad. They were depressed. So how's Jesus going to handle them, though he's walking towards Emmaus? Or Emmaus. How's he going to handle all that? What is this Christ like? You know, we're so, we're so sometimes just guilty. Sometimes we're depressed. Sometimes we're discouraged. But Jesus comes alongside. We mope and dread. Here you go. I got some cute ones. You ready? Tom, you like these. We mope and dread as if God were dead. We fret and stew as if God were through. We moan and groan as if God were not on the throne. We weakly pray as if God were away. But He isn't. He lives, He lives, He lives, and we ought to remember that. And He's walking with us. Let's read a little further. <clears throat> We've already gone through two-thirds of the sermon, so be encouraged. Verse 18, And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering said unto him, Art thou only a stranger? Don't you know what happened? Don't you realize what happened in Jerusalem? We don't even want to be there. And hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, what things? <laughs> you got to think it's a little humorous. What things? <laughs> okay. When you're in doubt, and you're depressed, and you're sad, you're discouraged, the Lord comes along and says, what things? I know everything. Matter of fact, it happened to me, he say, basically saying. And they said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet in, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. That's how they saw him. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. <clears throat> but we, we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all that, beside all that taking place, beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. They allowed their circumstances, ladies and gentlemen, to discourage them. But Christ, does, He does not let that stop Him. Aren't you glad for that? When you're down in the dumps and you got discouraged and you got all the circumstances, He's piling up on you and you feel like you can't carry anymore and you shouldn't be carrying them anyway because you got the living Christ who will carry them. Yea, verse 22, And certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher, those morticians who became missionaries, right? And when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said. But him they saw not. Now, how does Jesus handle you and me? He wants to walk with us. He wants to show His compassion and tenderness, yes, and He cares about our problems. Yes, even when we're discouraged or defeated. How does He handle it? Okay? You better start taking a note or two. Here we go. How does Jesus handle that? We're talking about the risen Christ. What is He like? He's still the same way 2,000 years later. How would he handle it now? How does he handle you? Look at the next verses. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. You have not believed them. It's there. It's in the Scriptures. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? You remember the women, the women at the tomb this morning? They rem, what the Bible says? And they remembered His words, Jesus' words. Where before He had told them He would die, on the, He'd be crucified, and He'd be buried and rose again. 
His words, take note on that one. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And look at what Jesus does. Seven and a half mile walk, Tom. They're doing some talking. And now Jesus is going to do some preaching or teaching. Look what he says. And he said, and beginning at Moses. You talk about a long sermon tonight. He went all the way back to Genesis. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets. Why? Because that was the prophecies of what would happen to the Messiah. Right? He expounded unto them in all the, please say the next word for me. Scriptures. The scriptures. The word of God. The scriptures. He expounded unto them. I would have loved to have heard what he expounded and said. The things concerning who? Himself. And just like Jesus, to roll the stone away, just like Jesus, to roll our problems away, he points us back to himself through the scriptures. And he goes on, he says, concerning himself, and they drew nigh unto the village, whither they went. It must have went on for seven and a half miles. Sixty furlongs, eighth of a mile is a furlong. All right. They get near Emmaus, Emmaus, whatever you want to call it. Whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. Hey, I've got to go on further to the next village or something like that. But they constrained him. Why? 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 Why did they constrain him? We're going to see the answer. Look at what he, he constrained him, saying, Abide with us. Please come in here to our house. Stay here with us. Abide with us. They hadn't had enough of Jesus. They didn't know immediately it was him. But something was happening. Some of you got saved. Some of you didn't believe. You did, some of you didn't believe and believe the Bible. Some of you didn't believe that Christ died and was buried and rose again. Some of you didn't believe. You've got friends and loved ones who don't believe and are adamant about not believing. But when he opened and expounded the scriptures to them, something started happening. Amen, Miss Christine. Something started happening. Glory to God. I'm going to run just for that. All right. He says, and it came to pass. Oh, wait a minute. Let's read verse 29 again. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. How long would it take to walk seven and a half miles? 20 minutes is a fairly good paced mile walking. Let's say they took 30 minutes. So how long would it be out? Um, three and a half hours to go seven and a half miles. And they're being preached and talked to from the scriptures, but something's happening. They wanted more. They tried to constrain him. You stay with us, please, please, okay? Would to God we had Christians that felt that way. It came to pass that he sat at meat with them, verse 30. He took bread. He had done that before, before he was resurrected. And he blessed it, and he break, and he gave to them. Again, look at the, the Christ. He's still going to be who he is, but he's alive again. And their eyes were... Say the word for me, please. Open. Wait a minute. We've seen this before. Now remember, Jesus doesn't look like Jesus. When Jesus showed himself to Mary, Mary thought he was the gardener. You remember? It goes on. He says, and their eyes were open and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. Boy, when we just get a chance to get to talk more to him, he leaves. <laughs> now, that's not part of the message, okay? But he is in your heart. And this is the next, this is the last point tonight. Look at verse 32. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us? You've heard it jokingly said, spiritual heartburn. Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us?
By the way, get that point. This same Christ wants, this living Christ, still wants to walk with us, still wants to come alongside and through His compassion be with us through all of our struggles and trials and what we're going through. And He cares for our problems and the problems of men and women. And He is the Christ who sets the hearts on fire. Is your heart on fire tonight? Mm, I know one lady in this room whose heart is on fire, Miss Christine. Amen. Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us, by the way? And while, say the next phrase for me, while he opened to us the scriptures. Their hearts needed rekindling. Their hearts needed to be reignited, if you please. Once they expected great things from this Christ, now... They just said nice things about him. Don't you even know? Hey, what, don't you know what happened in Jerusalem? Is they're telling Jesus? Uh, they were slow of heart to believe, Jesus said. But he corrected that. Once they had the thrill, but now they got the chill. Okay? But they remembered a better day. They remembered a better day when Christ was alive before the crucifixion. And you know, ladies and gentlemen, one of the things that will keep you from getting your heart reignited with Jesus Christ, the living Christ, is if you keep dwelling on the past and remembering a better day. Amen. Well, we used to do that. We used to be more faithful in church. We used to read our Bibles more. We used to witness more. We used to do those things. I used to teach a Sunday school class. I used to help with the young people. I used to run a bus route. I used to. All those things are fine and well. We don't live in the land of used to. Forgetting those things which are behind, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in, say the next two words, Christ Jesus. Focus goes back to Jesus again. Whoo, I'm having a good time preaching tonight. <laughs> what did he do? He took them to the Bible, he took them to the scriptures. When they were sad, they were depressed, they thought it was all lost, he took them to the Scriptures. How do you get your heart on fire again? you got to go back to the Scriptures. Amen. And let Him expound. Oh, glory to God. I wish I could preach a message on that tonight. Let the Holy Spirit of God expound them unto you. you got a cold heart, I guarantee you how to get it on fire. You got to go back to the scriptures. You got to take time. How many hours was it? Out? Three and a half hours of listening to the scriptures. And we can't get people to listen 30 minutes to a sermon. Yet they'll sit for six hours in front of a TV set and, and soak all the garbage in. And, and we wonder why our hearts aren't on fire. Whoa, boy, you're going to meddling now, preacher. Well, this is Easter, and Jesus is alive. Amen. And I want each and every one of us to, to, to have, be, have experience with the living Christ. And He's alive, and He's on fire, and we want to get right near the fire and let Him set us on fire by expounding the Scriptures. What else did He do? We're not going to take time to read it. I, I, was going, I could have, but I'm not. Later on, you find uh, in the other portions of Scriptures how Christ comes and ministers to those disciples who were sad, depressed, discouraged, defeated. And how did he handle them? Thomas was there the second time, the Sunday night after the resurrection on the first Lord's Day. He wasn't there on that first Sunday night, but he was there the second Sunday night. Because Thomas said, I'm not going to believe unless I reach my hands into the nail prints and in the spear prints in his side. I'm not going to believe. And again, the compassion, the tenderness, and how Christ wants to walk even with Thomas. Reach hither thy, thy fingers and and feel my nail prints. Reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. The living Christ shows himself in your life. And when he does, this is what changed this, this, these two disciples' hearts and set them on fire again. Cleopas looks over at his wife and says, Honey, I don't know about you, but I had spiritual heartburn tonight. They hadn't even eaten the meal yet. So it couldn't have been the meal. 
Because Jesus just prayed, and all of a sudden, everything comes alive. So it wasn't the physical food. They had spiritual heartburn. The heart got on fire again. Wow. Once it was dead, and now it's on fire. And what do you do? He showed them, those other disciples, his wounded hands. He expounded the scriptures unto them. His physical presence was with them. The word of God was expounded. It is the spirit that quickeneth the flesh, profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John 6, 63. He expounded from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He expounded from Isaiah, Jeremiah, the prophets. He expounded to them from the scriptures on what would happen to him. And something happens. God gave them assurance. He set their hearts on fire. What did they do? What did the scriptures say they did? All right. And verse number 33, and they rose up the same hour. I don't even know if they ate the dinner. Maybe they had it to go. There's a drive through or something, I don't know. All right, to go. And they left and returned where? Back to the place where they got discouraged. They confronted the discouragement with the fact that Christ was alive and the scriptures had reignited and set their hearts on fire, and the presence of the living Christ walked with them. Amen. And something changed them. And they went on back to Jerusalem, ran, they ran, they couldn't wait to go back to be with other believers, to be with those disciples and share with them, He is alive, just like Mary Magdalene said. Right. He is alive, as the other ladies had said. He is alive as John now had believed and as Peter and these others. He is alive. And that very evening is the first Sunday night where Jesus walks in the midst of them and with a door closed. Miracles start taking place again because now the living Christ is there. The sadness now turns to joy. The depression flees away. I know that some of them doubt. I understand that. But as no doubt he expounded some scriptures to them too. And as he showed himself and his hands and his nail prints and, and then even Thomas believing. Lives were changed. The living Christ will change your life. This week... Brother Tom, we went to the prayer room this morning, and I said, Happy Easter or Happy Resurrection Day or something to him. He said, yeah, it was that way last Sunday too. Right. You're right, Tom. He was alive last Sunday too. Amen. I got news, he's going to be alive next Sunday too. Right. And the next one. And glory to God, if Jesus comes, we pray he does. He made them seek to gather with other believers. He made them and gave assurance of His power. How did He give assurance of His power, ladies and gentlemen? Don't answer out loud, but think with me. I'm done. Here we go. I'm done. How did He give assurance of His power? He gave assurance of His power, yes, through the Scriptures. He gave assurance of His power because they changed. Cleopas and his wife, they changed. They ran back to Jerusalem. Something was different. Why? Because it was the risen Christ that made it different. As he came back, they came back and they were assured because the resurrection assures you of the power of God in your life. Amen. How can a Christian be defeated? How can a Christian be discouraged? How can a Christian be depressed? How can a Christian be sad if the resurrected Christ is there? And the power of the Scriptures is there. Amen. They, they needed their hearts on fire for God. And they were the ones I mentioned this morning. 
I think it's one of the greatest proofs of the resurrection that Jesus did rise from the dead, that the, all these 11 apostles went out and later gave their lives for this resurrected Christ. And as I said this morning, a, a true believer is willing to give their life for the resurrected Savior. But if Jesus had not risen from the dead, I don't see anybody willing to die for a dead man. Glory to God. Ah. That's why they became martyrs, not Jesus. And Jesus is alive. He is the Christ who walks with us, with men and women. He is the Christ who cares for the problems of men and women. He is the Christ who sets our hearts on fire again. Let's go and let, us, let him expound the scriptures to our hearts tonight. And let's get reignited for the great task that he is leading the charge in to see the salvation of the souls of men, women, teenagers, and boys and girls here in this neighborhood and around the world. Please stand with your heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe you need your heart reignited tonight. Let the living Christ reignite your heart tonight. That's what he wants to do. Come to him tonight. Let's get reignited with Christ. As Isabel is playing a verse of a song, won't you come to him? Talk to him. I love, I love that song. I talked with him today. And the cares all fled away. Wow. Oh, how we miss so much when we don't pray and don't walk with him and don't let the scriptures expound and, yes, expose our hearts and ignite us all over again. Miss Christine got saved tonight, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Hmm. Hallelujah. Thank God for a risen Jesus. Whatever you got going this week, some of you got some heavy burdens you carry. And I know it. As your pastor, I know it. My heart goes out to you, and I'll be praying for you this week. But you got one, an elder brother in heaven, who's seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's praying for you. That living Christ who walks with you and talks with you and you with him. And he's going to probe you. He's going to ask you some questions. He's going to help you become more like him. He's going to show his compassion and be tender towards you at times, yet sometimes... You know, why are you sad? Why are you sad? Hmm. It's all to draw us back to Him. I'm so glad. I'm so glad Jesus loves us. The risen Christ makes a difference if we'll let Him in our lives. Say, preacher, I've got some doubts. Well, why don't you come to him just like Thomas and let him show him himself. He will if you'll come honestly before him. I guarantee you he will. Be ignited again. There's a bunch of tracks out on that track rack. This is track month, and we're going to extend it through parts of the summer. Take those gospel tracks and let the fire of the Word of God ignite some sinner this week. Well, let's face it, folks. We won't do it unless our hearts are reignited and on fire. Let, let's, let's let Jesus catch our hearts on fire again. Change us. Send us back with a new vision, a new fresh vision. Be glad to come to the house of God, flock around God's people like Cleopas and his wife did to get back to those disciples and share, He is alive. And our hearts burn. No doubt they told him we had spiritual heartburn. And how you can get it too. And then just a few hours later, Jesus steps into their midst. And we don't go alone. He goes with us.
You can look up here. Um, how many got to go out back and watch the kids catch the candy this afternoon? Did you? That was a lot of fun time. JJ made some fantastic cookies, by the way, JJ. 